participants of shares. Dalawa ko po pa. No? No takers? Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. So, I'm gonna start my talk. Uh, so, I'm Mikong, and I'm here to talk about uh, the near future of Nginx. Uh, so, specifically, uh, last March 5, uh, Nginx just released uh, 1.3.14. That's uh, development branch version. And uh, the latest, I think the latest stable version of Nginx is 1.2.7. And what I'm going to be talking about specifically is this, this branch. So, to begin with, what's, what's Nginx? Uh, can I see a raise of hands who knows what Nginx is? Anybody doesn't know what it is? <laughs> HT Access for Life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, a friend actually told me that Nginx is better than Apache. And to be to be honest, um, it's it's an oversimplification, obviously, but it actually summarizes the sen sentiment of a lot of Ruby developers on to why they use Nginx. So it's relative to Apache. Uh, to be honest, um, when I switched to Nginx, I didn't really compare the differences of the two. So at the time, uh, the standard uh, practice for me was to use Passenger with Apache. And then Passenger just released uh, Nginx support. Then there were a lot of blog articles saying, you know, Nginx is really fast, you should use it. So that's just how shallow my, my reason for switching. And so this might be better. <laughs> so Apache is like Microsoft Word. There's a million options, but you only need six. Nginx does those six things, and it does five of them 50 times faster than Apache. So that's one of the popular quotes about Nginx. But we still haven't really defined what Nginx is. So Nginx is an open source web server. Um, can also be used as a reverse proxy. A lot of the uh, common setup in Rails apps is to use Unicorn, and then you'd have Nginx as the reverse proxy. Nginx would be the one receiving the requests and serving the static files uh, for the users, and then for everything that hits Rails, so it will uh, route it to Unicorn. So back to the topic, 1.3.x. Um, if you, it's a bit small, if you, if you go to the roadmap of the Nginx project, uh, these are more or less the features uh, that are listed in the 1.3.x milestone. We're not going to be talking about all of them. Um, just uh, five of them. And the other, those items I haven't marked in bold, we're just going to uh, talk about them briefly. So, to begin with, let's start with HTTPE tags. Who's familiar with um, this? Uh, who else? Who else does? Does anybody use this? Have you used it? So, HTTPE tag in Rails, um, it, it's, uh, it's actually supported since Rails 2.2 and it's part of Rails caching. Um, so what what they usually usually call it in Rails is conditional get support. So what it means is that it's a way for the server, the web server, to tell the client that the page you re requested for uh, you're requesting for has not changed. So you know just use whatever it is that you have in your cache. So the server would use these two HTTP headers, e tag and well. Last modified is part of the conditional get support. So e tag is one of those um, headers. So the e tag is the ID that represents the content. So when 
when the content of the page changes, your e-tag should change. And then last modified, it could just be, um, if it's a model in Rails, it could just be last updated on at or if it's something, if it's a more complex page, then uh, you have to use something different. On the browser side, so this is what the request would send back to the server. So the the browser would, or any caching could store the e tag and the last modified that received before, and then when it sends a request to the same page, it will send it back in the if not match or if modified since HTTP headers, and. If it's the same, then the server would return uh, 304 not modified, and you know, and you, uh, you don't have to generate the entire content again. Otherwise, you'd have to generate it. Okay, so that's HTTP tag. Um, the next item is OCSP stapling. Um, actually, when when I read about this, I had no idea what this is. So. Uh, to explain it better, let's begin with CRL. That's a Certificate Revocation List. So when you have a server that you want to be secure, you buy um, SSL certificate from a certificate authority. And then those CA would uh, provide a list of certificates that they've issued that has been revoked. So those certificates are no longer valid. And so uh, the servers or you know the, or the browser can actually keep a, a list, and then when you request, so you, you check if the in the list if the certificate is still valid. An alternative to certificate revocation list is OCSP or uh, stands for Online Certificate Status Protocol. So the advantage of this is that you don't need to request for entire for an entire list from the CA. So when you visit the site, you just need to ask for this specific certificate that uh, the site you're visiting is using, and then the CA would said if it's uh, would say if it's uh, revoked or not. So there are two uh, problems with this approach. The first thing is that whenever you visit a site that's secure and you use OCSP, you're basically announcing to the CA I'm visiting this site, so it's a privacy issue. And the second issue is if it's a heavily uh, visit the site, then if the CA goes down, so they can't check if the certificate is revoked, and then the users won't be able to visit the site. So, an alternative to this, which solves those two problems, is OCSP stapling. So, what it does is the server itself that has the certificate would be the one to request from the CA uh, that it's valid, and then when you visit the site, you won't have to go to the CA and the server would just staple the OCSP response from the CA to the um, to the user so you don't have to go to the CA server and one issue that uh, one might think is that well if that's the case then it's basically the server itself that you want to check if, if it's uh, you know if, if, it's, uh, if it's using valid certificate it's the same server that says that it's the valid certificate, so isn't that a problem? Um, but what, hap what happens is that the response, the OCSP response of the CA is actually signed. So unless unless the server could, you know, make a response that's signed that that looks as authentic as the the original OCSP response, then there's no problem in security. Okay, so. Third item in the features of Nginx is the chunk encoding on input. So what 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 is this? Um, what happens is that the server instead of uh, what usually happens is that you, when you generate a page, you get the content of that page and then you you uh, the server responds with that page with the length of the entire response. So with chunk encoding, instead of saying the content length instead of, uh, these are headers by the way, so instead of specifying this header, you would use the transfer encoding header and the value is chunked and you could immediately start sending chunks of the response without waiting for the entire uh, response content to be generated. So it's basically streaming and 
the advantages of this is so uh, you could keep the HTTP connection open. So if there are more uh, things that the server needs to send to the browser, then you don't need to reestablish the HTTP connection. And if it's a secure site, uh, you would know that HTTP connection with uh, SSL verification uh, is a significant uh, performance hit. So another thing is that some headers need to be uh, need uh, take time before their their value is computed. So if that's the case, then use transfer encoding chunk again, and then you don't have to wait for that header to be uh, computed. You just immediately send the response and then just send the header later on. So, but then in, in the list it says chunk encoding on input. So this is actually a header that can be used on both sides. So the browser can also say, you know, uh, transferring uh, encoding chunk. And yeah, so I, I think an example of this is if you're uh, posting a big file, for example, and you don't know the size yet, if it's a generated file, so you can immediately upload the file and stream the chunks without specifying the length of the of the one year the file you're posting. We, we'll have an example later on how how this uh, how chunk encoding is used. use some water. So the next is, uh, we're going to talk about web sockets. Who here has uh, used or used web sockets in their project? <laughs> um, but any, uh, do you guys know what web sockets is? Have you guys heard of it at least? Okay. So in web sockets, you keep a connection between the browser and the server open. And then uh, you could communicate in real time without you know, opening new connections. So for example, a chat application, uh, there would be multiple people having, uh, uh, it's connected to the server using WebSockets. And then, so the person I'm chatting to would send a message. Then I don't have to send a request to the server asking, there's a new message from that person, the server just immediately sends the message to me because there's an open connection using WebSocket. So another example is um, there are a lot of apps out there with uh, real-time charts. So we had a project in my company where we need to update the chart every second. And obviously, if you send a request every second, that's not, that's not very a very good way to do it. So with WebSockets, you know, the server just sends um, the new data point and update and we could update the chart. Um, so before WebSockets, there are actually many ways to implement real-time apps. Uh, yeah, for example, Ajax long polling, you'd send an XML HTTP request and you'd have a long time out, let's say 90 seconds or so. And then, you know, if, if the server sends a response, then you'd process it and then you'd need to send another uh, yeah, a request to, to keep it open. Uh, another one of the, the mechanisms that for real time is uh, forever iframe. Yeah. And this actually uses chunk encoding, the one we discussed earlier. So you'd have an iframe that's hidden, and then it's requesting from a URL that the server actually says chunk encode, uh, transfer encoding chunk, and so you keep the connection open. And then the server could send script tags with the JavaScript that we need to run. So as you know, when the browser receive, receives uh, JavaScript, it immediately runs them. So then you'd have simulated a real-time app. Um, so there's Socket.io. That's a JavaScript library that wraps all of those in. Uh, so you don't have to worry about what mechanism to use. So it supports WebSockets, I, uh, Forever iFrame, it, you know all the or most of the mechanisms out there and uh, because these mechanisms actually have different supports so some browsers for example WebSockets is only supported in IE 10 so if, if your users would use 9 so you won't have WebSockets so there are different issues with, uh, for, for the different mechanisms so in NGINX uh, so so how WebSockets work is 
we actually send an, uh, an HTTP header with a val uh, upgrade with a value of WebSocket. And then that's the only part that needs the HTTP protocol. The server, if it supports uh, WebSockets, it would upgrade the connection to WebSocket connection. So it would start using the WebSocket protocol. But the problem with Nginx is that when, when communicating with the client, with the browser, it can communicate with HTTP 1.1 headers. But when it communicates with, uh, you know, for example, Unicorn, if you're reverse proxying Unicorn, it doesn't know about, so it only communicates in HTTP 1.0. So you can't um, can't pass upgrade uh, header to the uh, Unicorn. So you can't establish a WebSocket connection. So that's that's the limitation of the uh, before the WebSocket support was uh, implemented by Nginx. So that was, um, I think, late Feb. They finally released 1.3.13 that supports the WebSocket proxy for Nginx. So we had a project. Uh, I would just like to share that um, we had Rails and Node.js. So we had a Rails app for the for the look of the app, and then Node.js would be the one that returns uh, real-time data for the for the charts. And so Rails is running on Unicorn, and Nginx is reverse proxying that. Ideally. Uh, Node.js could also, uh, if, if Nginx supports WebSocket, it could just you know, reverse proxy for, for Node.js as well. But before the WebSocket support, we had to use HapProxy that understands the upgrade header. So, but then HapProxy doesn't support SSL, so, so you need STANEL. Or last December, HapProxy started supporting SSL in their development branch, so you could also use that. But, Anyway, we could finally remove these two things because of the new WebSocket support of uh, Nginx. So the last item, so we've discussed the four below. So the last item is PD. Um, who have uh, what sort of PD aside from Brian? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. So Speedy was <laughs> Speedy was made by Google. So if if, if you go to uh, the project and there's an article there, a document there explaining the motivations why they made um, Speedy. It's actually it actually says it's experimental there, but it's no longer experimental. It's uh, an open de facto standard. So a lot. A lot of uh, browsers and some of the big sites actually started using it, so it's now sort of standard because of the adoption. So it's also the baseline of the HTTP2 standard, which was drafted uh, last November 2012, so it's quite new. HTTP 1.1, I think, has been finalized since 1999, <laughs> so it's about time that we replaced it. And so HTTP 1.1, that's, that's where upgrade header is, the chunk encoding. Um, if you use Rails, uh, you know, when, when you need put and delete methods, you know, it's wrapped around, you're still using post and get. So HTTP 1.1 standard describes those other methods. And it, uh, the E tags also is HTTP 1.1. So the goals of Speedy is to uh, reduce latency and increase security. Um, in in their tests, uh, they they increase the they reduce the page load time by 64 percent. So some of their tests would be around 50 percent. So basically, uh, it's like double you know to load the page faster. And considering that they are encrypting the content as well, so because usually if if you add uh, encryption to your site, it becomes slower. So even with that, it's still you know half the time or less than half the time. Browser support, obviously Chrome because it's from Google, <laughs> and Firefox supported it uh, for a year now. So before Firefox 11, it's disabled, but in 13, it's already enabled by default. And then you have the Silk browser in Kindle, I think and Opera supports that. 
and the websites that use it, obviously the Google website, search, Gmail, and the bigger social network you have, Twitter and Facebook. And I've read from uh, what WordPress announced that it would support Speedy, but I haven't confirmed if it already does right now. So I mentioned it's uh, one of the goal is to increase security, so it uses TLS and the extension NPN. So what is TLS? TLS is Transport Layer Security. It's the it succeeds uh, SSL. So actually, when we say uh, SSL, we're actually referring to TLS. So before uh, before this um, before my research, actually, I thought that TLS was only for emails because when you set up your SMTP in Rails, <laughs> you'd have what's that? Uh, yeah, yeah, the uh, auto, you know. Start TLS auto thing. So yeah, start TLS. So what actually happens there is that um, because the email is using a standard port, it's not encrypted by default. So there would be a TLS handshake, and if both sides uh, support it, so they switch to the to to use this encryption. And so Open SSL actually also uses TLS. So so I'm only familiar with Open SSL, so I didn't think that it was using TLS at the back. And NPN, it's, uh, it means next protocol negotiation. So similar to WebSockets where uh, they, there'd be a handshake and then to upgrade the protocol from HTTP to WebSocket. So here, you're upgrading to um, Speedy. So because um, they can't just use an arbitrary port because a lot of the ports are blocked. Usually only ports 80 and 443 are open. So they need to use the standard ports. So that's why they, they use, you know, they still use HTTP and have that. Um, well, in, in TLS, they did have that um, negotiation in the action. So, what is crime? Uh, crime is a security exploit that's very new. And it was demonstrated last September 2012. And uh, the vulnerable thing is the sites that use uh, compression speedy uses compression for for the for its uh, to reach the to reduce the latency so they actually compress the content so unfortunately that's what crime targets so it, a common use of this is to uh, get the contents of a secret, secret uh, cookie. So, uh, if you've heard of session hijacking, if, if the hacker would get the contents of your cookie, then they'd be able to, you know, interact with the website as if they're logged in using your account. So, so, so uh, the ones that use compression, actually, HTTPS, uh, TLS compression uh, uses compression, not, not all, but also Speedy. It uses the TLS compression, and then so so to do to protect yourself from this vulnerability, in the client side you could disable compression, or in the server side you could disable the compression as well and serving the site. So when 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 the vulnerability was demonstrated last year, they actually demoed using Stripe.com, Dropbox, and GitHub. So when that was uh, presented, these three sites immediately turned off their compression so that they're no longer vulnerable. And um, so Chrome actually patched, is patched, or patched already to protect from this vulnerability. Firefox also. And IE doesn't use compression nor does it support speedy, so it's safe. <laughs> and, yeah, it's safe, so no vulnerability there. And, but I think the question is mobile browsers. Uh, we don't know if the mobile browsers are still safe, and we know a lot of people, you know, use the internet and connect with this. So we need to be familiar about uh, about this issue. So it's actually interesting how this works. Um, what what they do is they find a way to insert uh, character uh, plain text characters in in your um, encrypted cookie, and so if they uh, if they put certain characters and then it get, gets compressed more so they know those characters are yeah so they get an idea what's in there 
So if they add characters and it doesn't get compressed as much, so they, they're not using that character. So you know, by brute force, it's actually quite fast. I think in less than two minutes, you'd be able to get the content of your, your cookie. So, so these are the features uh, in 1.3.x. And um, actually, uh, if, if you're not familiar, Nginx development version is actually uh, stable for production use, at least that's what I heard. So the only thing unstable about it is the API. So they could change you know, what features are in it or how to configure it, but in terms of using it in your site, it's, it's stable enough. So, so thanks, that's my talk and that's my email. Are there any questions? What point the hackers uh, stand when they need to put in the extra characters? What? Where on the way the attackers yeah. uh, do the crime? Uh, how, 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 how do they do it? Yes, what place along the chain? Uh, um, I, try, I, try to, uh, I try to understand that part. And in the demo, uh, so they visited the sites and then they, they logged in to those sites in HTTPS. And then they had a web, a compromised website. If you visit a com compromised website, that's not in HTTPS. So they find a way to control your browser. So then they'd send requests to, for example, um, to the site that's encrypted. But they could, for example, introduce those characters in the request, for example. So that's oh, no, your, your client server. Yeah, all, all in the what middle. Where are the okay, like, where? So in, in the example, the user supposedly visits a site that has been compromised. So the site has been compromised. yeah, an non non secure site that's compromised. So if you're logged into three sites that's uh, in HTTPS, and then you visit this fourth site that's not encrypted and then it's, it has been compromised by the hacker. So they could add requests to the, for example, to those encrypted sites. And I haven't really checked how they added the plain text, but they're running it in either image tags or just JavaScript. So that's the demo. They also said that they could do if, if there's a, it's a man, man in the middle attack in a proxy server. So if, if they compromise a proxy server that you're going through, so. But I, I haven't really studied how they could inject it in the cookie. So any other questions? Thanks.